today we have one lightning talk for you guys here at Nanog84. So please welcome Michael DeBoer to the stage, and he'll be presenting NOCUS, NOCUS? NOCUS. NOCUS 7330 Incoming Storm. Uh, Michael is from Tampnet, and he's actually based in Amsterdam, so he traveled a bit of a way to get here. Uh, this, yeah, <laughs> this is his second time presenting. Uh, his first time was at Dallas. Um, at Nanog 68 for a lightning talk called Peering Management System about a service called Hibernia. Um, welcome back, Michael. Thank you very much. All right, I think that I'm actually uh, the last speaker on stage then. <laughs> um, so my name is Michael DeBoer and um, I work for Tomnet. Uh, and I want to tell you a little story. Uh, Tomnet is specializing in offshore telecommunication. Uh, telecommun offshore telecommunication poses its own set of extra difficulties opposed to the regular networking that we already know and were explained. Uh, one of the problems that we have in, the, in our Gulf of Mexico network is uh, incoming storms. Internally it's known as uh, NOC US 7330 incoming storm. So uh, I'm going to talk to you a bit about it and uh, hopefully you'll find that interesting. First, a little bit uh, what TopNet is doing in our business areas. I promise you this is not a commercial talk, but uh, we need to set the stage a bit. We specialize in uh, providing connectivity in oil and gas industry, offshore wind farms, maritime, and uh, since we are running fiber from offshore asset to offshore asset, we also have a very unique fiber routes uh, through the North Sea and the Gulf of Mexico. So with that, we can also um, uh, supply the international carrier market. Um, yeah, I said again. I am. Uh, uh, this is our. This is our uh, Gulf of Mexico network, which you can see over here. Uh, it's a coverage area. We are building a uh, LTE 4G network uh, to supply maritime industry, uh, ROV vessels, uh, exploration, oil and gas industry. Uh, we also have a fiber running uh, from. Uh, which you can see the landing stations on the top left uh, to uh, Pascula on the right side. Um, our network consists of microwaves uh, from platform to platform to platform. Um, so they're all very intertwined. And we also try to connect platforms into, uh, into the fiber, uh, which you can see is the gr green line uh, on the bottom. So uh, in August, 2021, Hurricane Ida was, the deadly, was a deadly and destructive category 4 hurricane uh, that became the second most damaging and intense hurricane to make landfall in the U.S. state of Louisiana on the record behind Hurricane Katrina in 2005. So that actually hit our network uh, pretty, pretty hard. And I am sitting in Europe at my desk and I receive an email from my boss sitting here in the room as well. Uh, that the storm now has changed to a tr uh, tropical storm, and it uh, is named Ida. Uh, and then, back then, we were still expecting it to be a Category 2 or a Category 3. And yeah, for me, working in the North Sea area, not from the U.S., it's very remarkable to see such emails land to your inbox. Who is expecting hurricanes over your network or through your network? So what we see here is the estimated trajectory of Hurricane Ida over our network. Uh, again, you can see the platforms that we are uh, building with the micro uh, microwave hops in between. And you can also see the fiber. So all the operators in the Gulf, they were evacuating their platforms. Um, everybody left their assets as is, put everything uh, nice and tidy and, and went off their uh, platforms. Category four, Hurricanes mean uh, wind speeds up to 140 miles an hour with gusts up to 165. And it was expected to hit on uh, Sunday, the 29th of August. Um, yeah, obviously we were expecting uh, outfall on our microwave systems. We, uh, we accounted for all our personnel, a lot of that. A lot of our personnel lives in Louisiana, uh, so we account for their safety as well. Uh, we rented backup generators and, uh, and we checked our uh, spare supplies. If, uh, so hopefully we can recover as quickly as possible. So this is what it looks like if a category four hurricane uh, travels over your network. You uh, can see the eye of the hurricane winking at you. Um, 
yeah, this is frightening uh, for us as a network operator, but it's not even, it's, it's our network, but it's the entire state of Louisiana who has a big problem at this point in time. Uh, so yeah, that's very unfortunate. So the problems that occur, obviously power issues. Um, we power our equipment based on generators which are supplied from the operators of the platforms. They shut down their generators, batteries drained, our equipment got offline. Um, we had dishes, uh, microwave dishes, which were out of whack, so that needed to be realigned. Uh, we had a lot of damaged equipment. We had uh, microwaves uh, dented. Uh, we actually had dishes missing. Yep, sorry, it's gone. Um, yeah, pr all the platforms were unmanned, and um, yeah, there was no way of telling what, uh, what uh, the damages is, or what the damage was. Uh, we, uh, the recovery challenges was obviously damages to the platforms as well. Uh, flares broke off, uh, railings of the platforms were unusable. Uh, all the helicopters which we used to fly off to the assets were relocated out of state, so we could actually not head out to the platforms. Uh, Joe Biden was, was nice to visit uh, the state of Louisiana, closing off the, the airspace, so we could not fly again. Yeah, very unfortunate, but... <laughs> uh, and then Port Fouchon, which is uh, a very big, uh, or the most important um, uh, ne uh, uh, base for the oil and gas industry in the Gulf of Mexico, was damaged. The roads to the base were uh, covered with debris. Uh, the power lines at the base were all destroyed and uh, the water was rising. So that was very unfortunate as well. So all the operators who were actually supplying their offshore assets uh, from Port Fouchon needed to set up new supply bases, uh, which just delays um, our repairs as well. Uh, you can't fit the microwave dish in a helicopter. We had weather challenges uh, in the week after. Obviously, we had the good COVID, COVID situation still going on. And uh, yeah, since everybody has problems, it's not only us. So there was a very limited amount of technical resources in the industry. So to summarize, at the worst point in time, we had 112 sites down. Uh, 10 people worked around the clock to bring the assets back online. And again, I find this very remarkable that the people who work for us, uh, they also, they live in Louisiana, they also have problems at home and still come out uh, to get the network uh, repaired, as, repaired as quickly as possible. So I have a lot of respect for that. Uh, after six days, we had 45% of the network recovered. Uh, there were 110 t tickets created for our operations team in the US, and we had around 50 dispatches offshore to get it all fixed. Um, the, the ticket that we had opened, the, the, the big ticket, uh, dragged out for a long time. Um, some platforms actually never got fixed because the damage was so big. Um, yeah, so let's have a quick look. On the left side, you see a, a microwave dish uh, with a dent in it, rendering it useless. On the right side, you see them just blown out of whack. Uh, and unfortunately, if you have a microwave system and you want to realign the antennas, you need to do that on both sides. Uh, so you need an engineer on one side, engineer on the other side. You need to fly to both assets <coughs> to, to get that uh, link back online. And we also have the intermediate hops, which are offline, and then stuff on, the, uh, on a stick it's also offline because of some of the links. On the left side, you see a Port Fouchon. Uh, you can see the power lines uh, being destroyed. You see the water rising. Um, and on the right side, you see one of our beach crossings. You see uh, our own antennas on the bottom, just uh, misaligned, but also all the other operators uh, who have equipment in that same tower. Having, uh, so everybody wants to get into those towers to realign their antennas at the same time, um, yeah, which also gives problems. <coughs> uh, <coughs> sorry. Yeah, we see... <coughs> 
we see more um, uh, dishes being dent by the mere force of the wind pushing from the front to the back of the uh, of the dish. And you also see the the cover or the protective parts of the of the dishes blown off on the on the right picture. So yeah, we, obviously we learned lessons uh, as an offshore or as a company specializing in offshore communication. We are uh, used to rough uh, uh, rough terrains. Uh, yeah, but we learned as well. Renewable power solutions uh, could help us, like wind or um, or solar, to keep stuff online or at least at a, a low power situation. Uh, even if uh, installing solar panels is also uh, difficult, you don't want them to blow uh, away in the next hurricane. We are uh, re-evaluating uh, our antenna structures and we are improving in that. We are adding redundancy, more microwave links. We are tying more assets into the deep water fiber. Um, we train for hurricane readiness, so uh, we are prepared for, uh, for more hurricanes to come. Uh, we are uh, strategically relocating spare parts, uh, so we're not depending on one stock of spare parts in our network, but we could actually uh, have it geographically uh, s separated over several locations. And we reserve more helicopter and uh, technicians prior to incoming storms uh, as much as possible. So, yeah, I hope you find this uh, interesting. Um, if you have any questions, please. We do, we do not currently have any questions in the chat. Okay, we've got one. Hi, I'm Lee Martez with AWS. I guess I was wondering, um, I think in the tech field, it's very difficult to think about um, environmental ramifications to technology. Um, and with your company, what were the financial distresses that were related to an unforeseen natural disaster like yeah, that's an actual very good question, which I am uh, I can't give you the answer to. Uh, um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, it's difficult to account for national disasters in our network. Um, we're also expanding to Canada, and we're expanding to uh, maybe to Africa or Brazil. Uh, and well, we are already thinking maybe of uh, problems with icebergs or pirates uh, posing threats to our networks as well. So uh, offshore is interesting. Uh, next to the network. So a good warning for other people. Just think about it, maybe. Exactly. Yes, <laughs> of course. We did get one question. I'll jump that one in here and then go to you next. Um, George Amodio asked, what is the ballpark cost per year to operate the network? <laughs> uh, again, yeah, these are uh, great questions. Well, uh, I don't know the exact details. Uh, we are operating a network in the North Sea. We're operating it in, in Norway. We are operating it in the Netherlands. We're operating it in uh, the UK. And all the networks are built uh, different. Uh, the Norwegian network has a lot of fiber in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you, and a lot of times the companies build the fiber from platform to platform. Um, they, they just have the, 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 the platforms are staying there for so long that it's, uh, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the Netherlands, the infrastructure is older and it doesn't make sense to invest in fiber. So we build microwave to microwave, which adds a lot of cost as well. So yeah, these companies, they pay a lot of money for uh, well, relatively low bandwidth uh, links, as you can imagine. But I can't give the exact uh, numbers. <laughs> I don't even know them. Good. So Warren Kamari, Google. So on one of your last slides, while this mic's over driven, you spoke about improving the antennas to survive better wind loading. How do you sort of do that so it survives hurricane weather? They have to be big. Yeah, good question. Um, so the microwave antennas, they are mounted with side struts uh, and it's just reevaluating uh, the way the side struts are connected to the structure of the platform, where they are connected to the platform, uh, the thickness, etc. I mean, it sort of seems like if you had a shroud over the front of it that made it more aerodynamic, it wouldn't catch as much wind and get a hold of it. But I'm guessing somebody's already thought about this. And <laughs> the engineers. Thank you. We do have a few more questions here. Uh, Jeff Bartig asks, did your network map show that you have underwater fiber paths to some of your offshore nodes? And was there any damage to this fiber? And if so, how do you handle the repair? 
Uh, luckily, uh, yeah, to answer the question, yes, we do have uh, uh, Shopsea fiber traveling to, uh, to the platforms. Uh, unfortunately, the fiber was not uh, damaged uh, during this specific incident. But uh, yeah, obviously these fibers uh, get uh, damaged as normal subsea fibers are get damaged as well. So we have companies on standby. Uh, if they get damaged by shunt fault or uh, they, they reel them up, mm -hmm. splice them back together and, and repair them and let them sink down again. Yeah. Yes. And we have another question on the virtual since I don't see anyone standing up. Blake Willis, um, I'll probably butcher the pronunciation, but I think he's saying thank you in Dutch. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> How bad a hurricane do you think you can withstand and still recover like this without a complete rebuild? Is there gear that can stand up to a Category 5? Whew, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I don't even want to think about it, to be very honest. <laughs> um, the, the idea of a Category four, uh, 4 hurricane and what that did on land and to the people, uh, it's crazy. So I, I don't want to think about it. But eventually, uh, our company can overcome, obviously. Right. Well, that's all I have in the chat here. And looks like we're out of questions here as well. All right, thank, thank you very so much. much for your time. You're welcome. <laughs>